So today, um, today's speaker is Paul Dykowski, who manages the uh, um, programs in land use and transportation for the, the local government uh, commission, and has been the uh, director for their uh, Center for Livable Communities since uh, 1995. Uh, the local government commission is a, uh, a, really an award-winning nonprofit that has a national reputation and is based here locally in, in Sacramento. And much of the organization's work, which I'm sure Paul will talk about, uh, focuses on providing support to community leaders and elected officials around uh, healthy and walkable communities. Paul, uh, we were just talking about his, his background. Uh, he's trained as an architect, urban planner, and urban designer. Uh, has deg uh, degrees from City College in New York City. And he was born and raised in Mexico. Um, as part of his work at LGC, he is a co-author on a number of documents that focus on transit-oriented development and street design. And he also co-edits documents on similar topics, such as infill development, traffic calming, smart growth zoning codes, and compact development. Uh, Paul also conducts workshops and uh, leads courses on these and other related topics. And I've known Paul now for just under 10 years. Uh, and we met at a national conference. And he's, uh, if you see any conference announcements about smart growth, livable communities, healthy communities, uh, you will most likely find uh, Paul's uh, name on one of the panels. So please join me in welcoming Paul Lekowski. Uh, thanks, Michael, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was a little intrigued when I saw the, the title of uh, these, these lectures, uh, Design as Activism, um, partly because I think that's often something that, that we forget about when we go into a design profession. But um, I actually got, you know, went into architecture as a change of career uh, and came from an activist type of background. The first 10 years after my first college uh, degree, I spent uh, doing uh, labor organizing, um, working with uh, welfare recipients, uh, lived a few years in India trying to address some of the development issues there. So it was nice when a few years ago, back in 95, I was able to work, start working at the Local Government Commission um, and put into practice uh, and combine, I guess, my interest in design with my interest prior to that in, uh, in community activism. And uh, in, in recent years, have really had a chance to, um, to expand on those uh, even more. Let me see if I find a good spot here where I can see. I guess I'll, I'll do here. Let me give you a little bit of background on the commission. Uh, Michael did mention that we're a nonprofit um, membership organization based here in Sacramento. Uh, we have about 1,000 members from mostly California, though we do have a few other uh, states included in our membership. Um, we actually started in 1979 as a state commission called the Solar Cal Local Government Commission. So our first uh, mission, you might say, was to work on solar energy. Um, as a state commission of local elected officials. The commission actually um, was folded a few years later when there was a change in administration in, in California, um, but it remained as a nonprofit. It basically mer uh, morphed into a nonprofit organization. And during the 80s, uh, before I was there, I was working on um, pollution prevention, waste management, hazardous waste, and then in 91 started working on land use issues. Um, one of the things that got us involved in land use was a set of principles that were put together in 1991 by a group of architects and urban designers um, that talked about creating, basically going back to, to traditional neighborhood design, creating complete communities, complete neighborhoods, not just uh, sprawling subdivisions, uh, where you'd have a mix of uses, where you'd have walkability and, and bicycle friendliness built into it, and where the longer trips that you'd have to make would be done through transit. So it's, again, transit-oriented development uh, for the regional trips. And also with a central focus, a place where people could come together and, and engage with one another as communities. Uh, the principles got a very positive response from our members. We had uh, over 200 or 300 cities now that have adopted parts or all of them into their general plans that, that, um, that basically establish how they will develop in the future. Um, we've been very active in the movement that's emerged since the early and mid-90s called the Smart Growth Movement, as Michael mentioned. 
uh, which really has incorporated a lot of these concepts into, into their work. And since 2001, we've organized a national conference called the New Partners for Smart Growth Conference, uh, which just took place a few weeks ago in, uh, in New Mexico. It, it moves around the country every year. Um, one of the principles that's emphasized, or one of the strategies that's emphasized in the Awani principles is the importance of engaging residents in a community in, their, in designing for their future. You know, what is it we want to be as we continue to, to evolve? It's not just something that, you know, the elected officials or the staff or the planning commission should determine. It really is up to the people that live there to have a, a say in that. And as you can see, one of the principles talked about plans being developed through an open process and that participants in the process should be provided visual models of all planning proposals. The idea there being that a layperson who's not in the design profession or planning profession you know, won't understand from the language what we mean when we talk about you know, transit-oriented development or mixed use, but when we provide visual models of that, then they can respond and tell us what they like or don't like. One of the first documents we published after the Yawani Principles came out, uh, and this was shortly before I came on at the commission, was this one on participation tools for better land use planning. Uh, it's been distributed by the American Planning Association for many years now. Uh, it was actually first printed in, in uh, 95. And through, in it, we basically go through the importance of engaging the public as well as some techniques that you can use. Um, and you might ask, well, why, you know, why involve residents in good plans? Well, one of them is to ensure that good plans remain intact over time. Uh, city councils, planning commissions, city managers, city planners come and go. But a plan developed with resident input will have a long-lasting constituency. Um, when you're working in a political environment, it's important to reach beyond just the political leaders who aren't always going to be there. Um, ultimately, you know, you do get better plans. The residents in a community understand what works and what doesn't work a lot better than, you know, a consultant who might come in and help that community develop a plan. Or even somebody who's, who's an elected or staff person who may not live, uh, staff person may not live full time in that community. I already talked about good plans surviving political changes. It's obviously a great way to engage the residents in their community to overcome the cynicism that a lot of folks have about, you know, government in this country these days. Um, hopefully that's starting to change, but, you know, we, we go through these cycles where people just feel that, you know, government is not, for me, it's not helping me in any way. And it's a, a really a way to, to ensure that residents feel not that they have access to City Hall, but that they really do own City Hall. And if you work at all, and I'll show you some projects we've done with communities, um, it really does change the attitude of the people that participate in, in these processes. They really start to feel that they can be involved. Even people who may not speak English very well or, or speak English as a second language, um, they start understanding how they can interact with that jurisdiction. The projects I'm going to talk to you about today were actually done through a process, um, through a, uh, basically a funding program that was, that was started by Caltrans, which seems sort of like a disconnect. We think of Caltrans as building big highways and not being that sensitive to sort of local concerns. But the reality was, uh, is that uh, there are some folks in Caltrans that understand the importance of having better coordination between our land use, how we develop in communities, and our transportation system. Um, Caltrans ends up being at, at sort of the mercy of local jurisdictions that might make bad decisions about where to put new development. Uh, they may want to add interchanges on freeways uh, or simply that have development along a state highway. So back in 2001, Caltrans announced the planning grant program. Uh, it has several, but the two that we've worked with is one called Community-Based Transportation Planning and then an Environmental Justice one. And we've done most of our projects in communities that qualify for uh, the Environmental Justice Grants. The grants uh, in and of them themselves emphasize the importance of engaging the public. They say, if you're going to apply for one of these grants, you have to use a process where you're going to be working with the residents in this community. Uh, they support development of plans that better integrate land use and transportation, what I was mentioning earlier, and really the motivation for Caltrans to even be interested in this. And generally, they support the concept which in, the recent, in recent years we're referring to as complete streets. And those are really trying to get streets that are not just designed for cars, but that also are accommodating non-motorized tra traffic, uh, people on bicycles, people walking, people in wheelchairs, seniors, uh, children, etc. <clears throat> One of the nice things about these grants is that it actually allows nonprofits like 
the local government commission to partner with the community and actually apply jointly. So if the funding comes through, then we actually get work out of that, out of that grant to, to work with that community. And since 2001, I think we're up to about oh, close to 30 jurisdictions, as well as several Indian tribes that we've worked with. Um, and these are the types of plans we do, downtown neighborhood revitalization, uh, corridor or Main Street revitalization, you know, looking at future development, how is a community going to grow, how, where will new development go, the types of things that urban designers really focus a lot of. And of course, a lot of, a lot of them address the issue of how do we accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists, sometimes on state highways uh, or crossing freeways. Um, a lot of the projects we do, we use a charrette process, which I'm sure you're uh, all familiar with sort of the charrette process you go through while you're in, uh, in design school. The charrette process we use is sort of taking that approach of an intensive, multi-day exercise with a community where we engage them in multiple events. And I'll show you what that means in a few, in a few seconds. But these are the types of activities that we, um, that we, that we use, uh, and, and I'll describe some of them in more detail. Um, just a list of some of these are some of the environmental justice grants we've done include uh, several uh, tri you know, Indian tribes. Uh, a lot of these uh, are very low income communities, typically uh, towns in the Central Valley, uh, some in Riverside County like the town of Mecca, which was you know, 98, 99 percent Latino, uh, predominantly a Spanish speaking community, uh, farm worker community. And we've got some, some others like that along, along the way here. Um, we often have a series of events that we go through. As I mentioned, this is a multi-day process. It's not just a one, you know, we don't just come in for one day and, and have one workshop. We actually start with uh, focus group meetings uh, during the days on Thursdays and Fridays. We have an opening workshop on a Thursday evening. Um, then Saturday during the day is when we really try to get folks in the community to start, you know, drawing on maps and, tell, you know, sketching out or just writing ideas down of what they would like to see and how they would like to see things addressed in their uh, town or city. And then, um, you know, we come back to, that to, the, to the residents uh, later in the week with sort of the, the more refined drawings that our design team has put together to respond to that. Um, before we even start the, the, the design charrette, you know, this is months out, we work with the community on um, identifying local partners. We typically like to find a local nonprofit or community-based organization that can reach out to residents because, you know, we're in Sacramento, we're going down to Mecca, we need somebody local that can reach the residents there, tell them what's going to be happening and engage them. Uh, we try to do as much outreach as possible working with the local partners. We assemble a design team as needed. Typically we'll have an urban design, one or two urban designers on that team. Sometimes several will, will come during the charrette. Uh, a traffic engineer, a transportation planner. Uh, we work a lot with uh, Dan Burden who heads up something called Walkable Communities, a great facilitator as well as an expert in creating walkable, bicycle-friendly communities. And then we collect a lot of information and data ahead of time. Uh, for outreach, we use every means at our disposal. Um, <clears throat> I've had a few communities say to me, well, how many people maximum do you want to show up? And my response is always, the more the merrier. We've never had a problem where we end up with too many people showing up at the, uh, at the, at the events. Uh, you want to do as much outreach as possible, use every media possible, um, in different languages, go out to the community organizations. And here are just some quick examples of flyers in English and Spanish um, that we've done. This is back from 2003, I believe, in Fresno. Some of the flyers, um, you know, banners uh, in, in communities. And this was one we used, actually our first uh, charrette with a Caltrans grant uh, where they put up a changeable message board on the state highway. And everybody in this little town in Tulare County of Cutler and Arosi, <coughs> excuse me, and Arosi <coughs> saw, <coughs> saw these um, message signs the week before, so they knew things were going to be happening. Um, again, these are a lot of the techniques we use, and I'll go through these in more detail. Um, the workshops, you know, again, we, we, oh, actually, before I go into the charrettes, I did add in here one that is sort of a separate <clears throat> event that we do that is a shorter, you know, sort of a half day, one day uh, type event called the Walkable Community Workshop. So I did uh, drop that in. It's, it's um, something we developed with some other folks about six, seven years ago. And basically you work, you go into a community, you do a presentation on what kinds of things you can do to make a community more walkable. 
and then you go out with the residents there and, and actually stop and look at what wor what's working and what isn't working. So here we have some of the residents actually um, illustrating what a curb extension at an intersection might look like. So you get you know, folks actually standing out there. And this was one I did a few years ago uh, with the Latino community in South Central LA. And then people come back to the room and like we do with the charrette, uh, although in a much more concentrated period, people sit down with the maps, write their ideas down, and provide input to the, the planners and policy makers that are there in the room with you. And in this case, we actually got the council member uh, for that district in LA, uh, Jan Perry, to attend the closing so she was able to hear from the community what, you know, what they were saying. So that's the walkable community workshop. It's a you know, four to five to six hour event on a single day. The charrettes are actually multiple uh, events. We start out often with focus group meetings where we talk to different stakeholder groups. Basically sit individually with groups that may not be comfortable at a public workshop saying certain things. We learn a lot about the issues, um, allow people to speak candidly, and we get a lot of information in a short period of time. So this was one of the early ones in uh, Cutler Orosi. Uh, this gentleman owns the bakery in, in one of the towns, uh, some of the staff, some of the residents, one of the property owners there, and you start talking about you know, what are some of the concerns, issues, um, really learn quickly what, what kinds of things will work. In Salinas, we worked in the old Chinatown, and it was probably the most diverse, it was the most diverse uh, charrette we've ever done because this was a, uh, right next to their downtown. This is the, the, the place where first Asian immigrants to this country lived. It was a one place in Salinas where they could have a home. So the, the Chinese American populations, the Japanese American populations, the Filipino populations all started in this part of Salinas and still have an interest, even though they've moved on and moved out. Um, there's still a Buddhist temple there, a Confucian church. There's still a strong interest in, in improving the quality of this, of this uh, neighborhood, which has become really neglected. It's now sort of where a lot of homeless services are provided, where you know, drug and alcohol treatment centers are located. So when we talk to groups, we not only talk to some of the uh, um, older Asian American residents there, we also talk to some of the, the people who get services at the, uh, the, the shelters and, and, um, and soup kitchens and so on. Um, and then up in, uh, in Mendocino County, this is Round Valley. Anybody know where Round Valley is? No, I've never, yeah, most people have never heard of it. Covalo. We work in towns that nobody in California has ever heard about. Uh, Mecca, nobody had ever heard about it before. Covalo. Anyways, this is a small town, very isolated. It is a Round Valley. There are several Indian tribes that were relocated to this valley and treated, uh, as many of the tribal communities, very, very poorly, uh, who now have their, their, their tribal lands there. And there's also a small town of Covalo. So we work with both groups there. Um, we also sometimes go out to talk to the youth, either teenagers in high school or a um, you know, fifth grade class. Um, here, you know, we, we have them drawing their routes to school. We ask them where they would like to get, where they may not be able to because of, of limitations in crossing streets or traffic or, or problems of that sort. Uh, this was in Winters, not too far from here, with a, a fifth grade class. I think they're drawing their routes to school. They're then presenting it to the rest of the class. And the great thing about working with especially um, elementary school kids is, you know, within 20, 20 minutes, they'll draw you a map. They'll sketch things out. You know, adults, you have to sort of pull teeth to get them to to draw anything, but children are not inhibited. We get some great little drawings. Uh, I love the note on this one. These maps may not be accurate. Um, here are some other ones, you know, and, and you start getting a picture for some of the challenges that uh, the kids, you know, or what their experience is. I mean, this kid's clearly being driven because all she's drawing is, you know, the road. Um, you know, some de great details, a stoplight, community center, uh, et cetera. Uh, so again, try to involve teens, youth as much as possible. The workshops, you really have to make them fun. They can't just, you don't, you don't build them as come to the workshop. You say we're going to have a, a design fair, or a fiesta, whatever. Uh, talk about it differently. And food is a key ingredient. You've got to have food there. Uh, so in Mendocino County at Round Valley, they had a big um, uh, fire going out there. They were roasting you know, hamburgers and fish and vegetables and so on. We had over 100 20 people show up for that uh, opening workshop where all of this was going on. Um, in some communities, like Cutlerosi, we had the mariachis play, um, made it really into a fair. 
when we started working in this town, the local leaders said, oh, it's going to be impossible to get people to show up. Nobody participates. It's really hard here. Um, but we got the word out. We put up those me the, a changeable message sign, and we had over 130, 140 people show up the first day. So it can be done even in places where people typically don't participate. When we worked with the Hoopa Indian tribe, they had a local, uh, a local band, so they played at the uh, opening. In Salinas, we had both taiko drummers and we had the dragon dance. Um, great sort of cultural event. I mean, it was 30, 40 minutes of dancing and drumming and so on before we started talking about, okay, what do we do to improve this place? And I love this in Laytonville, Mendocino County. The high school has two, not one, but two rock bands. They have the freshman and then the senior one, and they uh, played actually at the end of the workshop. So people hung around and danced and so on. Um, and then we went back to the mariachis down in Mecca, uh, probably a more colorful and well-outfitted group in uh, 2008. People love it. I mean, this is part of the, you know, making it a joyous, you know, uh, festive occasion. <clears throat> in Round Valley, um, we had uh, some of the local women and children. Actually, they all, by the way, they, they organize all this themselves. I mean, we help, you know, and, and give ideas, but the folks there are the ones who put all this together, uh, doing the, some of the, the native dances. Um, with some of the, the, the drumming and music in the background. So again, great uh, events. Um, then, you know, what do we do actually do the, during the workshop? I talked about giving people visual uh, exercises. Well, some of the exercises are not visual. This is one where we just ask people on an index card, write down your vision for your community 10, 20 years down the road. Think big, think long term. What would you like to see your community become in the next 10, 20 years? And you get some very, you know, some really great ideas. This was in uh, town of Fowler in the Central Valley. People are writing, now they're, they're reading some of their cards to the rest of the group. And you get some really compelling visions. You know, walkable, tree-lined streets, unique storefronts, great public city hall, um, strong local businesses, vibrant, attractive, safe, a place for all to congregate, um, things to meet the needs of all people, and so on. We then follow with a values exercise. We ask people to write down five, on, in, on, on sticky notes, um, five reasons they value living in this community. And then we have them put them up on a board. And we have other people come up and find like values. So people start recognizing that there's a lot more that they agree on in their community than they disagree. So there starts to be that common sense of, of, of ownership um, and of identifies the values residents hold dear. So here's the exercise in Laytonville. And you start seeing, um, let me see if I can read you know, in Laytonville, they're up in the beautiful part of Mendocino County. So nature, greenness, I can read that one, you know, is a big, big issue. And these are all the, the, the stickies that people had written, something related to the environment. Oh, here we go. Fr um, friendly people, tolerance, trust, nature, trees, greenness, etc. And each community will have a different set of values. Uh, there are some that overlap, of course, but often there are specific issues and reasons people live in those places. And then after a presentation, we typically do about a 40-minute presentation on how we can create more livable communities. We talk about you know, what are some of the design features of a well-planned uh, and well-designed community. How is it, you know, can we uh, create places where you don't need to get into your car for every trip, where you can walk places, uh, create um, you know, good park spaces, all the things that make up a great community. And we present, uh, you know, those, those often are from similar types of places. Uh, sometimes we'll show things that are working well in that community, if we can find good examples, uh, or, sign or nearby communities. Or we'll bring you know, ideas and visuals. But this is a very visual presentation with a lot of images, a lot of drawings, a lot of photographs to really get people to, to understand and visualize themselves what they could do where they live. And then at the end of the day, we just, uh, of the evening, we brainstorm what are the key issues you want to address. And we give people six sticky dots. You've probably seen the big dots that come on the sticky things. And the reason we use six is very scientific. Um, they actually come in strips of, of four by six. So they're easy to cut if you want to get six. We used to use seven because they came in rows of four by seven. No, no, you know, there's no, no, you know, it's not a scientific poll. It's just a good way of engaging. And here's, we're writing down some of the key concepts and then people are up there. And they cannot double dot. So they have to find five different or six different things that they think are important. And what's really key about this is sometimes when you're brainstorming, people will raise issues. I had one developer years ago in Watsonville say, 
well, I think we should just put sidewalks on one side of the street. And we put it up there. We don't, no judgments. We just put brainstorm, put all the ideas up. And then I noticed as, peop as people went up and voted, um, once he saw the range of ideas and concerns people had, even he didn't vote for the thing that he had mentioned. People get that bigger picture. They start recognizing what are the, the, the more important priorities for their community. So here's what that exercise usually looks like. We get a lot of, um, of these types of sheets with votes. You know, and sometimes there are issues that are not going to be addressed directly by our design project, but it's important for the local jurisdiction to know that, for example, people want you know, more uh, sports field there uh, or things of that sort. And here are some of the priorities. I think this comes from the town of Mecca that we heard about. Shopping center, you know, we weren't going to be directly addressing that. We could identify where you know, a shopping center might go in that town or how it could be designed, but you know, that's something that might happen later. A university, again, not something in our control. And then again in, in Spanish. <clears throat> On Saturday, what we do is we start out the day by getting people out walking and just talking as we walk about what's working and what isn't. It's a real low-tech, easy way to, to, to uh, learn about a place. And also, there's an educational process because you can talk to people about, well, you look at, at a street. What's wrong with the street? Why doesn't it work well? What's the design of the street? How does that influence the way people drive on the street? Things of that nature. Um, so here's a walkability audit. We sometimes try to put the traffic engineer in a wheelchair so they can experience what it's like to actually get around in the things that they've designed and built. Uh, in this case, we get some role playing. This police officer is um, pretending to be a, a seven-year-old. The gentleman back here is pretending to be a 70-year-old. What are some of the issues you might encounter if you were a different age in that community? Uh, and you know, again, we talk about what's working, what isn't, talk about issues, talk about you know people here talking about widths. We're talking about what's, pro what's happening at this intersection with cars turning. It's just, a, again, a short, quick, efficient way to learn about the place. Uh, this was one we just did a few months ago in um, Yuba County, in um, a very low-income community there, where our traffic engineer is, again, addressing these issues. And you can do them in any climate, any place. This is not one that I was on, but it's doable. And then later in the day on Saturday, after we've um, actually talked more about some of the issues that were prioritized, on the previous evening, on the Thursday or Friday evening, we, um, we give a presentation there. And then we have people work in small groups, usually about eight people to the table. And this is one we did outdoors, probably the only one where we were able to do that in Hoopa, beautiful uh, weather. And we do the presentation, a technical presentation on the priorities. And then people work at the tables with the maps, talking amongst themselves and identifying what are the key issues they want to address. Not unlike you know, if you were working as a, as a team, excuse me, on a design pro problem or project, uh, something you might be doing in your landscape architecture design studio. It's, again, that team effort, identifying, but again, with a, a lay audience and in a very short period of time. And again, people are working with the maps, they're drawing on them, then they're presenting to the rest of their neighbors you know, the ideas that they came up with. So here are some of the maps. Um, I guess this is from Hoopa. People start drawing out you know, where a new town center could go, you know, what they'd like to see the road design look like, uh, and so on. And we, we get a, a wealth of information. And ultimately, what comes out of these is a plan that really is based on what we heard from the community. It's not us coming in and developing a plan for them. It's basically taking what we hear from them and, and organizing it into a plan. Um, photo simulations, I don't know if you've seen these. You may have done some of these. They're a great way to get the message across, again, with a lay audience that may not understand what you mean when you talk about a particular design. This was sort of, this is the low-tech version. Uh, there's an elementary school here. There are kids crossing. There's a state highway. Cars are coming in at 50, 60 miles an hour. Um, so we said, why not just put in a median there, make that crossing easier. You don't have to cross the whole distance. You cross one leg at a time. So you show people how that can look. Uh, up in Smith River, we showed how putting in pigmented bicycle lane and median can make the roadway look narrower, slow the cars down a bit, uh, create a, a safer place for, for bicyclists and pedestrians uh, to be able to walk. And then this was a sort of a larger view, same concept. This is approaching sort of the town center. Um, looking back, there's a casino here, a health center, some housing, gas station, how this intersection might be transformed. Again, using just color in, one ca in this case, and then over time, 
um, we actually proposed a different approach, which was a roundabout, actually putting in a, a different type of intersection treatment that slows cars down significantly and makes it a lot easier for pedestrians to cross here. <coughs> and our uh, Dan Burden likes to throw in the Beatles and show that the Beatles could cross, um, you know, would be safe crossing in your community if, uh, if you made these improvements. There's also the high-tech version. That was sort of the low-tech, quick and dirty Photoshop version. Uh, these are done by a guy called Steve Price, who does a beautiful job in just transform showing the transformation of a street over time. Uh, these look, you know, like they're, some of them are hard to tell whether it's built or not built when you look at the final drawing. This was in a small town up in Shasta County. And again, we show options. In this case, we said you, may, you probably don't need four lanes of traffic on this road. The volumes really are never going to be that high. A lot of people are hesitant to, to, to take away lanes, do a road diet. But we said if you did, this is one way to do it where you could still maintain the bicycle lane by having what's called back-end angled parking. So cars are now basically pulling past the spot, backing in. But when they pull out, it's much safer because that motorist can see you know, if there's a bicyclist or if there's a car coming. And here's the last one, one that we weren't involved with, but again, showing the transformation that can take place. Um, you know, after the charrette, we basically develop a, a plan that really is owned by the community. We write all this up. We include a, a discussion of the process we went through. We include photographs. You know, people who, who pick up the plan later understand much better what went on. So this is one we did with, um, these are the consultants who work with Opticos and Alta Land people in Mendocino County, one of the big issues there was trails. You know, uh, this is a, a rural community. They're not going to build sidewalks, so simply having either paved shoulders along the highway or a trail network would be a, a, a great improvement to quality of life there where people could get around. Um, and a lot of people don't own cars and don't drive there. This is a very poor community. So this is identifying a network of trails that could be developed over time, uh, the high priority trails between the tribal center and health center, the housing and the town, um, and then some medium and low priority. Uh, and then looking again at sort of what's the, the five minute walk shed, you know, where are things currently located there? Uh, how could we make things wet better? How could future connections work as, as the town develops and as the, 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 the rancheria grows? You know, is there a way to actually add a development next to the town so you have access to the goods and services that are there so people can, can get to them easily? So they're not living a mile out of town. So this is showing, again, that network and an open space. Uh, and then some pretty detailed plans that we develop as well with our urban design team, illustrating, again, some of these concepts, uh, including in this community they wanted painted intersections. Um, you know, they've got an artist community living up there. They said, you know, we could go out and just, you know, sort of uh, show that the intersection is more than just a place where cars belong. And this is something that they've been doing up in Portland where they have like a a fair where they go out and paint the intersection. So we propose it in front of the schools, the high school and the elementary school. Um, and again, some other ideas for a farmer's market and a library commons, which the town is already doing. Uh, and I'll show you, uh, this is one of the main roads coming through town, State Route uh, 162, transforming it from this to something that looks more like this, where you'd have more parking by having angled parking um, a little bit more protection for the pedestrians, uh, slow traffic down. And here's a drawing that our consultant did illustrating what that might look like. Again, visuals to get across the message to folks who, you know, if you showed it in plan view, they wouldn't understand. And then future development on tribal lands, as I mentioned, adjacent to the existing town uh, and better connected to the services that are there. <coughs> just a, a blow up of that area. There's also actually a camping grounds that's, uh, over, that the tribe owns over here that could be developed and become a real asset bringing tourism into to this town. Um, so what do communities do after we're gone? Um, there's a lot of short term things. And again, it's, I, I like to say that it's almost a leap of faith when we go in to do these projects because you never know who's going to show up. You never know how many people are going to show up uh, before you get there. And then you don't know after you leave how well it's going to be implemented. In some places, you can tell the leadership is there when you leave. You have a committee of people that are going to see it through. In other places, you, know, you sort of leave feeling that maybe 
things won't happen. And sometimes you're surprised, they do. But these are some quick and, and easy things that can be done just with paint on asphalt or, or, some, or you know, easy concrete applications, curb extensions, for example. Uh, longer term types of projects, you know, now we're looking at actual development that may take three, four, five, ten years to occur. Um, a lot of the communities use the plan. We often tell people, you know, it's very hard to go after funding if you, you know, uh, from a, a state agency or a bond measure if you don't have a vision of what you want to do with that funding. By having the plan in place, you now have a vision that makes it possible for you to go after the, the, the funding. So, um, you know, we, we give people a lot of ideas about where to look for, for, for grants to do the work. Um, in, in Laytonville, I'll just show you there were a lot of changes that occurred. Some of them were already planned by Caltrans before we showed up, but we were able to influence how they occurred. This is an existing intersection where they've had a lot of crashes. Cars are coming basically off 101, the highway, at high speed here. Don't even know that they're approaching a town. There's a building behind me that has been hit about three times over the years. So we transformed that intersection into something that looks more like this. They're, they actually lowered this, gr this uh, grade here so that motorists could see that they were entering a different place. And there are more things that have to happen. They need gateway treatments as you enter into town to again signal to the motorists to slow down. But at least they put in some sidewalks, some uh, curb ramps, cr you know, some crosswalks, and so on. This is looking in, the, in uh, the other direction, actually, at the intersections that we just saw is down there. Uh, as a result of the project we did, the property owner here came in and made some improvements to this building um, and started sort of sprucing it up, painting it, cleaning it up. And here's another shot. There's a, a supermarket over here. And some things, you know, we got the bike lanes in. We didn't get, we wanted a buffer strip between the, the motor, you know, basically between the road and the pedestrians on the sidewalk. They couldn't do it. There were reasons why they had to put the light, the light fixtures in the back of the sidewalk instead of out on the um, street edge. But ultimately, they at least did get some of the concepts right. And that's the other thing is you don't always get 100% of what goes into the plan. I mean, we often leave and say, you know, you may only get 50, 60, 70%, but at least you now have a vision to move forward with. This was a little town in, uh, down in Fresno County. After we left a few months later, they started doing some streetscape improvements, simple things, but better designed um, traffic signals. This was, again, one of these quality of life issues. These trucks were, be, were parking there overnight, and they actually run, some of them run their engines uh, because they have refrigeration units. Well, their houses, they're people living right here. And the people who live there came to the workshops and said, hey, can you, you know, stop these trucks from parking behind our homes and keeping our kids awake all night with their, their noise. So after we left, they put in, you know, no truck parking and started enforcing some of this stuff. Um, they also started sprucing up some of the um, facades. This one's still underway. They haven't put in the awning, uh, but they went in and developed a facade improvement program in their downtown. Uh, this is another example in uh, another town where they, in Fowler, where they went in and, and basically did some facade improvements. And finally, um, uh, we found out just a few weeks ago, this was a place we left and we never were sure what would happen after we left. Well, I was surprised about two months ago to see that they now have a plan, a project study report with Caltrans for $6 million worth of improvements in downtown Hoopa, which means you know, putting in sidewalks, uh, landscaping the, the, uh, the roadway, putting in a median, really making some significant changes. They got a local artist to actually design a gateway uh, concept and even some unique Crosswalk markings, uh, great thing. They got some other, uh, an artist, you know, to develop some sculptures and some pretty wild designs for uh, street lights. I don't know if these will ever get built, but, you know, nevertheless, it was a way to get people involved. So um, ultimately, you, you do end up with a plan that, that I think has a better chance. And even if it doesn't get implemented, one of my arguments is the process of getting people together to work on these plans is powerful in and of itself. It does get people involved. Sometimes things that you may never have expected to occur come out of that process. Um, some towns go in and start updating their zoning code, which is also very key. Um, so I'm going to end there and give ourselves some time to, to have some uh, discussion, questions, answers, et cetera. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Anyone? Yes. How 
Um, well, partly we can do it because we're a nonprofit, so our rates are lower. I mean, a typical consulting firm would charge double or more what we charge to put this on. Now, we also do work with private consultants. I mean, we, there's several design firms that we work with, um, you know, and, and we try to pay them what they would get paid, you know, commercially, uh, you know, competitively, competitive um, job. Um, but we also sometimes will get them to, to do pro bono work. Um, we work with an architect, um, Michael Piatok, in Salinas, who does great um, affordable housing designs. And, I mean, he must have volunteered, you know, 20, 30 hours of his time to the project. And he said to me afterwards, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it's exhausting because you're also working like a typical charrette. You're there, you know, not up all night, but we worked long days and into the night. After we finished the charrette, Mike said to me, I can do about one of these a year now. So he wasn't offering to do a lot of them, but he likes being able to, to give back to the community. And I think a lot of the designers we work with understand and, and really uh, are, you know, like doing that kind of work. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Do you, have, um, do you find when you're trying to get the community involved, is there like a certain group that you find difficult to get? Yeah, the question is, is there a certain group in the community that's hard to get involved? You know, it varies from place to place. It's very, very specific, very local, very specific. Um, you know, sometimes even the, 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 the city bureaucracy that you're dealing with, the city planning department or city manager, even sometimes, even the, though the, the grant came to them and we're going to be doing something to help them, sometimes we have a tr hard time engaging the staff. Uh, sometimes the electeds, who you would think would be jumping all over the place trying to, you know, get something done and take some credit for it, even in some places they don't show up a lot. So it really varies from place to place. It also depends on the project. You know, in, in the town of Mecca, uh, this is a town that's been around for 30, 40 years and has had almost no improvements made over that period of time. In the middle of Mecca, there is what we joked was we call uh, Lake Mecca. It was this puddle of water that was, that was just always there. And when we asked people, you know, where's this water coming from, we got 10 different explanations. Nobody had ever figured out, you know, what the heck's going on here? Is there a leaky pipe somewhere? Is there drainage from the ag fields? Um, in that town, people were so eager for change that we got great turnout from the community, as long as they knew that they were welcome. You know, once we, we sort of communicated that and we had somebody local there working with us at the health, actually, public health has become a great ally in these projects. Uh, because folks in public health, first of all, they know how to work in communities. They know how to, you know, reach residents and, and nonprofits. Um, and they're now really getting more and more concerned, and you may have heard about this, uh, about the design of communities from a health standpoint. Because, you know, we're seeing one of the big issues for them is, is the obesity epidemic. And there's, they're recognizing that the lack of, of, um, of, of healthy food and places for people to be physically active are contributing to that. So public health now has become a great ally. In Mecca, they worked with us. Um, Shasta, a bunch of projects. In Round Valley, it was actually the health center, Indian health center that we teamed up with. So it, it really varies from place to place. And you know the cultures are different too. And um, you know in some places you just uh, you know that things are going to start late because that's the way things work there. Um, you know other places, uh, you know some people will come. The nice thing about the charrette is not everybody has to come to everything. You can get some people there Thursday night. Different group of people may come on Saturday. Different group on, on um, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday. Although by the end of it, most people who came earlier want to see what you came up with. So you get good turnout. But it, you know, it, it, it provides different opportunities for people to, to engage. Yeah. Anything else? Anybody interested in working on these? We always are, well, are interested in having volunteers. If oh, I was going to ask. <coughs> If there were some individuals interested in this mm -hmm. type of work, uh, do you guys sort of uh, solicit volunteers to interns or other yeah, types it, of activities? It depends. Um, we've had a few projects where actually the design designer that we're working with, uh, we had uh, one project in Fireball where um, our urban designer was actually teaching a course, an urban design course at Berkeley, their Master of Urban Design. So he actually made this project part of his school, of his class project. Mm -hmm. So that was beautiful because. They went in and did all this additional work for this town that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Um, you know, the one challenge for us is if we do have volunteers um, working with us, we usually try to find them locally because 
you know, our budget is limited to covered travel and other expenses. But if there's some, you know, if there are any of you who really would like to experience what one of these is like, um, you know, let me know. I'll give you my card. You can drop me an email, and we can just, you know, let you know when we're doing one of these. And if it's, if we, if we can work it out, we can't pay you for your time. It's usually pretty, and we're pr usually on a pretty tight budget, but we can at least cover your your costs while you're there. And we're doing a project in Salinas now where uh, students, um, actually a class from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, mm -hmm. is going to be working with us there too. So we're more and more we're, we're sort of reaching out to the universities. Mm -hmm. um, we probably need to do more of that to try to, to, to team up on these projects. Mm -hmm. um, but at least now informally we might be able to do something. Right. Yeah. We can always use extra you know, hands drawing and sketching ideas out and um, you know, figuring out what, what kinds of things might work well. Talking to people there. Great. Thanks. Well, I hope it's been helpful for no other questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Michael. <laughs> Just make sure the sign-up sheet gets back to me, please.